So, we ended last time down here talking about how to iterate through stuff, go through a string by visiting every index of it, and we looped through every index. Oops, oh no, that is not what I want. Hopefully that will fix itself. I'm gonna have to restart the computer if that is gonna be like that. We'll deal with it. I'll get better. Now what I wanna talk about are two keywords that only work inside of loops. You might find them useful. So the first one's called continue. If you say continue just by itself with a semicolon at the end of it, like continue semicolon, it skips your current loop iteration. It just goes straight to the top of the loop like to the condition again. All right. Uh, it also, if you're in a for loop, it runs the increment uh, part as well. So I'll show you that. And then break, also you just say it by itself with a semicolon at the end. It stops the closest loop that you're inside it. Okay. So let me show you both of these. Uh, do I want to put them in the same file? Is my question. No, why not? Give you both of these. Here, like for seven. All right, so I don't know, continue and break.cpp. So let me show you both of these. So continue, start, skips your current loop iteration. So let's say we're printing from one to 10, but we've decided that we hate the number three. So four int i equals zero, i is, or let's do one. One, i is less than or equal to 10, i plus plus. And so this will range between one and 10. Yeah, i. So by default, it's going to print from 1 to 10, right? All the numbers from 1 to 10, just like we know how to do. But let's say we hate the number 3. Like, we don't want it to appear. We don't really want to change our code too much, but we'd like it so that 3 does not appear in our output. The way you can do that, one way, is to use continue. Continue skips your loop iteration. goes straight back to the top of the loop. Uh, with a for loop, it also does the increment process. So... If i is equal to 3, if I see that i is currently equal to 3, then continue skips the rest of the loop and goes to the next iteration. So if i is 3, it's going to skip this line. It's not going to print 3. It's just going to go back, i++, plus plus now 4, and it's going to print 4, 5, 6, because they're not 3 anymore. Yay, so now you get 1, 2, 4, 5. Any questions about that? It's just continue. It's a weird looking thing. It's just a, a word with a semicolon at the end of it on a line by itself. That skips the rest of your current loop. Uh, your current loop body iteration. So that's one. Let's continue. goes hand in hand with break. Break is when you want to stop the loop. If you're in a loop and you would like to end it now, no more, no more lines executed, jump out of the loop, please. That is what break is for. It exits the closest loop you're in. Come, we'll come back to this idea. Uh, this should get you thinking about what we're about to do later. The closest loop you're in. Uh, and so I'll make a while loop that just stops whenever the user types Q. Wee. Or, how do I want to do this? So I'll just repeatedly forever, while true, infinite loop otherwise, so forever, get a character from the user, say out, enter a character, Q to quit, and then, I don't know, char C, get C from the user, and if C is equal to Q, break. Stop the loop. This loop would not stop otherwise, right? It's an infinite loop. Interesting. So stop the loop. Otherwise, if it wasn't C, maybe we'll be like, C out, you typed, and then whatever C was. Just something using that value. You can imagine this is some more complicated thing. So, 
Enter character Q to quit. Uh, a, B, C, D, you typed all these things. E, F, G. It'll keep going forever. If I type A continuously, it'll just keep going. Uh, until I type Q. Because once that character C is Q, it will break, stop the loop, go to the end. Loop is now finished. Q. And then the program ends because there's nothing below it. So break stops the current loop, the closest loop you're currently inside of. Okay? So that's what break does. So break and continue. Any questions about those? All right. So that's those two. Let's keep on trucking. So slightly more complicated example. Now that we have math and loops under our fingertips, there are a lot of uh, infinite summations that we can implement now to compute cool stuff. So like there's a formula for E. Maybe you've seen this in a calculus class. So let's calculate E according to this formula. Isn't it cool? So uh, if you've never seen a summation before, what this means is just start N at zero and do this, and then make N one and do it again. Keep on adding forever. Just let N go to infinity. So this is equal to one over zero factorial plus one over one factorial plus one over two factorial, because N gets a chance at being every number up to infinity. Okay? So let's implement this. Let's uh, Implement each piece of this. Let's go up to, because we only have so much precision inside of a computer, let's go up to n equals 100. I think that's good enough. Okay, that'll give us enough precision for a double to print it out. All right? And here's the idea. For each iteration of our loop up to n equals 100, we'll start n at 0, we'll just do this. This will be one value that we compute inside of our loop. We'll compute this one time, and then the, in the next iteration, we'll compute this one, then this one, then this one, so on and so forth. Okay? And so we're going to have to compute our current term or something. Current term variable. Let's we'll set that to like 1.0 over the factorial of whatever our current n is. Factorial of n. And what we'll set that inside of each loop body. We'll set a sum variable as well. Remember how to sum all the numbers. We need to add all these together. So we'll start a sum variable at 0, 0, 0 0.0, and just repeatedly add in our current term each time. Okay? So first we'll add this into sum, then we'll add this into sum, then we'll add this into sum. Does that strategy make sense? Just repeatedly do that for different values of n. That will compute the number e. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to secretly, you can close your eyes if you want, I'm going to have to write a factorial function because that one doesn't exist in the standard library. I'll give you a sneak peek of where we're going in the next set of slides, I guess. Uh, and it needs to return a double because factorials of large numbers like 100 cannot fit in an int. So I will not forget that. What do I want to call this? E.cpp, I guess? I don't know. So here's kind of what we want to do. We want to calculate this repeated summation. So I'll start a sum variable at 0, double sum, 0, 0.0, and then for int n equals 0, n is less than or equal to 100, n plus plus. It's got a range between all those values between 0 and 100. That was what I decided. And inside of that loop, n has a different value. It's starting at 0, then it's 1, then it's 2, then it's 3, and I can use the current value of n to compute my current term that I then add into sum. Okay? So, double current term equals 1.0 over factorial of n, and then add that into sum. Okay? And then by the end of that, once we're done with all that, I should have a value in sum that is a very, very good approximation for e. Okay, so all I need to do now is make the factorial function, but does this process make sense? So n gets to range between 0 and 100, one at a time. We use n to calculate the current term of our summation. So first time it's 0, we'll calculate 1 over 0 factorial. Sec next time n is 1, n plus plus. We'll calculate 1 over 1 factorial, 1 over 2 factorial, all that stuff. And that will translate to this. So everybody see how that works? And you start sum at zero so that you keep on adding into it what you need to add. No, I'm adding current term to it. This is short for sum equals sum plus current term. Oh, okay. All 
That's what that syntax is short for. It would be some plus plus that adds one. Plus equals is different. Any other questions? All right, so let me secretly make a factorial function. You can look away if you want, but it's just, it's not too hard. It's got to return a double. It's called factorial. It takes a number that I want to compute the factorial of n, let's call it, and then it's just got to compute stuff. So the factorial of zero should be one. So uh, double result equals one, and we'll eventually return that result. You don't have to understand any of what I'm doing. I'm making a function. I haven't taught you how to do that yet. Uh, and then I need to loop. So for int i equals, I don't know, zero, i is less than n i plus plus. So n times, I'd like to multiply it by, uh, I guess we can start at one. Multiply that into result equals result times i. So let me, let me just double check that that actually does what I want it to do. So C out factorial of zero, one, two, three, and four. And if those are correct, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be correct. Let's see here. Yeah, I think I'm off by one. Actually, of two should have been two. So, let's see. I forgot that. Well, it's looking better. Zero factorial is zero. One factorial is zero. Factorial is one. One factorial is one. Two. Three times two is six. Four times three. It's just six times four again. So that's twenty-four. So that's right. Okay. So factorial is working, and now hopefully we can compute e. Wow, that looks like E to me. Isn't that cool? This is what computers were made for. Math like this. So that is how to compute E in a nutshell. Any questions about this? A nice little complicated example. Let me unpack this into a loop. All right. To get us thinking, I have a question for you. So please get into peer instruction groups. Go to our handy dandy written ice page. I'll clear it out. It's just just this one, honestly. Boop. So as a group, please answer this question. Write just a good example of an infinite loop in your group section of the Google Docs. So please try and make it super subtle. Don't just be like, wild true. That's an infinite loop. Try and make it as Difficult to notice as possible. Come up with some very subtle infinite loops because that'll help you when you eventually write your own accidentally. You'll know what to look for. Okay, so just take like two minutes. Try and come up with a good infinite loop as a group. What error will you include? And then we'll come back and look at them.
Another 15 seconds. All right. Let me make sure this answer I'm trying to answer is correct. So let's see. Let's see some good ones. Yeah, group zero, nice. You can forget a condition in a for loop. You don't need that. You can just not have one, and it will just essentially be true. It'll just be replaced with true, kind of like that. Yeah, if you get your condition backwards as well, that's a great example of an infinite loop. Once we get to CSI 45, I'll teach you that that's technically not an infinite loop, but I want you to think about it like it is right now, because ints are finite. You'll eventually wrap around to the negatives, which is weird to think about. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Group 12, I do not see a 4 or a while, so this is not an infinite loop. And yeah, group 16, as long as, let's see, while x is greater than 5 or x is less than 10, yeah, as long as x doesn't start out as like 6, 7, 8, or 9, I think you're... Or outside of that, actually. Yeah, there's a range of x values that let it work, and a range of x values that don't let it work. So yeah, always true. Oh yeah, I like group 36's answer. Look at that. That equals sign that should have been a double equals. That will ruin everything. Very good. All right. Yeah, so those are fun. Just keep those ideas in the back of your mind. Uh, because one day you're going to write an infinite loop. And you're going to wonder why is it infinitely looping. These are the kinds of things that are causing it. So great job. Any questions about infinite loops before we move on? I just have one last silly little example and then uh, we'll do fancier stuff. All right. One good thing that loops are for is just repeatedly doing something. So let me, uh, I don't know, let me make a cute little animated line of stars. Remember that pause function from the very first day of class that I used it for the, the karaoke program? I could use that to, as part of a loop, to just draw a bunch of stars on the screen and wait a little while in between drawing them. So it'll look like snow is falling or something. So I'll just draw a star, wait a second draw another star, wait a second, draw a third star, wait a second. And so it's like you're making a little path for yourself of stars. That'll be animated. That's how you do it. And so yeah, all animation is, is you're just showing a bunch of frames to people, right? You have, I don't know, have you ever made a flip book when you were really bored in elementary school or something? You draw one thing, and then you draw the next frame. You draw Okay, now there should be two stars. You just kind of flip them over really fast. So let's do that. Because, yeah, loops are good for that kind of thing, too. So, gosh, what do I want to do? Um, I don't know. Animation.cpp. Let me pull in the code from the first lecture, like 01 karaoke.cpp. I need this pause function. 
me, which is complicated. You don't need to care about it, but there it is. That'll just stop the program for a certain number of seconds. And then I can do this. I'd be like four int i equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus, so 10 times total, draw a star and a new line and wait for 0.5 seconds in between coming back to the loop again. So if you stall for a little bit, it will produce animation. And I encourage you to play around with this and make something cooler. Whee! So there it goes, drawing little stars 0.5 away from each other. You can make this really fancy if you want to. Uh, that's a good way to do that. You might want to look into what this is. String space comma no, sorry. String i comma space character. That'll make i spaces. That's what it'll do. Whee! So that's fun. Uh, yeah, just looping. Do the same thing in a slightly different way. Pause for a little bit. Good for that kind of thing. All right, yeah, that was my silly last example before I get into difficult stuff. Are we ready for difficult stuff? All right. We are ready for nested loops. And I do want to say right now, let me get this in the right font because this doesn't look right. There's a emoji font here, so I go much better. So this is traditionally a very difficult topic in this class, so maybe pay a little bit extra attention. Nested loops. All right, so you knew this was coming. So here is what you can do in a loop body, right? You can put any code you want in a loop body, including another loop. Why not? And you think of this, oops, you think of this as two loops together, right? This is an inner loop. This is the outer loop, yeah? And they can range as much as you want. Like this, maybe this while loop has i ranging between 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And this inner while loop has j ranging between 0, 1, 2, and 3. The trick to thinking about this and understanding in your head how this executes is that to the outer while loop, the inner while loop is just code. It's just Think of it as just one big line with a semicolon, right? Boop. That is one big line of code. It needs to execute all of this before it goes back to the outer while loop's condition, right? A while loop must con execute its body. The only trick is, this is itself a loop. So during each iteration of the outer loop's body, so it's like, all right, i is 1, let's run this body, it needs to run the entire inner loop. It must run completely. It's just, it's just like a line of code. It needs to execute, right? Before we go back, check the condition of the outer loop. Now i is 2. It runs the entire while loop body again, with j equals 0, 1, 2, and 3 all over again. So this is the key. This is what I want you to remember just like a big line of code. It needs to finish completely before you get back here. Question? Yeah, what is that, uh, what is that program you used to, to pick up on characters when you like rectangle with this one? Draw a rectangle with your cursor. Where? Like on here? Yeah. And it, you know, it auto picks up some of those characters. What, is that built into? Sorry to like Oh, that's just part of PowerPoint. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. That's just the drawing feature of PowerPoint. It'd be really nice for like just generic screenshots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I use PowerPoint. And I don't make it full screen because you don't get the cool drawing stuff if it's full screen. Yeah, so this is what I want you to remember. I'll I'll show you examples, of course. But are there any questions about this before I show you my first example of a nested loop, a loop inside of a loop? Here is the example that I think is the best one to see first, okay? This is a nested for loop. It has, it's looping, 4 int i equals 0 through 5, so this i gets to range between 0 and 4, right? And then 
in its body, every time it executes its body, it runs this inner loop, this inner for loop that has a j variable that it ranges between 0 and 4. Okay? So this loop executes its body how many times? Somebody tell me. Five. Five, good. Because i is going to range between 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's five total. And so that implies that this one also does the same. Also executes its body five times when it runs. We also. And yeah, let me walk you through this. And this is the inner loop. Every time we run the body with a new value of i of the outer loop, we run this entire for loop that allows j to range between 0 and 4 every single time, okay? So this is the output right here. Sorry, it's a little small. There's a lot of output. This is the output of this loop, this nested loop, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, and then it goes 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and then 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 0. Let me show you why it does that, and that should bring everything to life. So, when we run this for loop, we make an i variable, right? So i exists now, and it starts at 0. Is 0 less than 5? Sure it is. Let's run the body. The body is this entire for loop, yeah? It's the entire for loop. We have to run it to completion before we're done with the outer loop. So this inner for loop has a j variable that starts at 0. Is j less than 5? It sure is. So we're going to run this body. And we output i, j, and i is i i is 0, j is 0. We print 0, 0 first. Okay? And then we need to continue this inner loop. That's what we're working on right now. We come back to its j++, make j1, and then we go to the body again. It's just a normal loop. We just have to run it to completion. So now we print 0, 1, because i is still 0, and j now changed to be 1. Okay? So that makes sense why it's going to go 0, 1, 0, 2 now, 0, 3, 0, 4, because we're working on the inner loop. And then, once we have 0, 4, we are done with the inner loop. Yes? Done with it. So we're done with the body of the outer loop now. Which means J no longer existed. No longer exists. It only existed for the inner loop. We're done with the inner loop. Now we're back out here. We do I++ and do the loop all over again. So I is now 1. Is 1 less than 5? Sure it is. So let's do the body. Yeah? which makes j again, a new j, starts it at 0. Hey, is, uh, is 0 less than 5? It sure is. Let's print out i and j. But now i is 1 and j is 0, so it prints 1, 0. Do you see the pattern emerging? j++. plus plus. j is now 1. Is 1 less than 5? Sure. Do the body some more. Print 1, 1. 1, 2. 1, 3. 1, 4. There they go. Then we're done with this outer loop again. Or sorry, the inner loop again. We go back to the outer loop. Make i 2. Remake j. 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4. All that stuff happens all over again. Does that make sense? This is a great example to memorize, I think. You can see exactly how the values are changing and how i stays the same for longer because it's the outer loop. It's got a, this for loop on the inside needs to run to completion, which involves changing j. J changes more rapidly than I, kind of. And eventually, we're going to get to the end, right? So, uh, I don't know. I is going to become, J is gone again when we're in the outer loop. I is going to become 3, and we're going to range through all the J's again. I is going to become 4, we're going to range through all the J's again. J equals 4, 0, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4. And that's it. Because, once we're done with this inner loop for that time, we're going to say i++ plus plus one last time, i is now 5. 5 is not less than 5, and we're done. Okay? Does that make sense? Please tell me what is confusing. I will try my best to explain it uh, in a different way. But this, is just, this is just a hard new concept. This is the sad news. Is it making enough sense for now? Okay. So one neat thing is, let's focus in on this inner loop body. 
this line right here. Can somebody tell me how many times this inner loop's body gets executed? How many times does this particular green line get run? Is there a formula for that? How many numbers did I output? 25, why? 5 times 5. So this is running 5 times, right, this outer loop. Each time, this inner loop is itself running 5 times. See how they multiply? This line must get... gets executed... 5 times 5 equals 25 times. Very nice. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about this example. Are there any questions before I move on? All right, yeah, so first key idea, nested loops multiply the amount of work being done. So let's use that to draw a box of stars. So I'm going to draw a 4x4 four four box of stars using nested loops. Okay? And here's the trick. We are going to break this down into the following. The outer loop, let's go back to blue. The outer loop is going to worry about which line we're on. Which line here? And then the inner loop is going to print a single line of stars. This will make sense when I do it. Print. It's going to worry about printing a single line of stars. Single line of stars. And so here's the idea. Uh, four times because we have four lines, we would like to do the same thing, right? We would like to, oops. Will you let me get rid of that? There we go. Four times, I'm going to draw four stars. See how I can repeat this? I can make it a one big loop. If I knew how to draw four stars all at once, I could just draw four stars four times, and that could be a single loop. Yeah? So here's the idea. Here's our loop. Do four times, do the following four times. Print four stars and a new line. Does this make sense why this will draw a box of four stars? So four times, print four stars and a new line. So the first time, second time, third time, fourth time, we've now drawn a box. So do four times, print four stars and a new line. This is like a single loop. Does that strategy make sense, first of all? So I'm going to translate that to a nested loop now. Because what is printing four stars, but repeatedly printing a single star? So this will translate into do four times. Yeah, I could draw times better. There we go. Do four times. And then let's break this down. So first we have to print four stars. So that is itself, do four times, print a single star. And then after I've printed my four stars, I need to break the line. So print a new line outside of that loop. See how that's going to translate into that bit. And naturally, we get a nested loop out of the deal. So this outer loop worries about which line we're on, and then the inner loop worries about printing four stars on the current line. And then we also have to print a new line after we're done printing those four stars. Does this strategy now make sense? In English, at least. Because that is going to translate quite simply to code. Any questions about that? All right, let's do it. So, um, let's see, how do I want to do it? Yeah, INJ033. Zero less than three. All right, so, uh, I don't know, box.cpp. Four. So I need to do four times. So let's make a loop that iterates four times. Four int i equals zero, i is less than four, i plus plus. That's the standard way of doing it. When I first taught you, it was i at one, i less than or equal to four, but the real computer scientists like to start their eyes at zero and say strictly less than what they're trying to go to. So this does four times total. Four int j equals zero. j is less than four. j plus plus. That's the inner loop. 
is the outer loop do four times, then the inner loop do four times, print a single star. So if the body of this one is print a single star, star character. And then after we're done printing our four stars on the single line, because the inner loops, or the outer loops body needs to worry about the single line printing it and breaking it, then I need to break the line after I've printed my single star. Okay. So that should do it. So print a line of four stars and a new line. Right, I should just say print four stars and a new one. Okay. And then this one is execute the body four times. So this should make a box of stars. Four by four box of stars. There it is. Lovely. Any questions about why it's doing what it's doing? All right. So, uh, I guess let me open up Discord. So I want to give you this code if you want to use it. Uh, I'll put it on the screen as well. If you just want to type it. But I have a question for you now. I'd like you to modify that code that I wrote and change it. I'll give you like three minutes to try it and then I'll show you the answer. I'd like you to change it to print a hollow box of stars. Interesting. There it is on Discord if you want it. And then you have it on this slide as well. But take like three minutes. Try to change this code that prints a 4x4 four four box of stars to print a hollow box of stars. See if you can figure out what needs to change. Okay? And please help each other. So how do you remove the middle? And what does that mean? It's not like removal, right? It's more like print a space, isn't it? Instead of a star. Another 30 seconds to get your thoughts down and try it out.
Ooh. All right. Did anyone get it? Did you find out the secret? I'll tell you one way. There's a million ways to do this. But I think the easiest way to, to, to do it is to notice, like, what are the values of i and j when we're at each of these characters? I think that's the best way. So, for example, when we're at the first star, i is 0 and j is 0. When we're at the second star on the first line, i is still 0, j is 1. You'll eventually learn to do that. But here's kind of like the idea. The i's worry about which line we're on. So i is 0 for this line, i is 1 for this line, i is 2 for this line, i is 3 for this last line. And then for each of these characters I'm on, right, j equals 0 prints the first star. j equals 1 prints the second star. j equals 2 prints the third star, yeah? That's how that works. So here j is 0, j is 1, j is 2, j is 3. So for example, this star is printed when i is 0 and j is 1. This star is printed when i is 2 and j is 3. Yeah? What we need to do is figure out when we're here. And instead of printing a star, we'll print a space. In these four boxes. And so instead of just print a star, it'll be an if-else, like either print a space or a star, depending on where we are. So here's the condition that I would think about. What we want to have happen is we notice that we want to print a space instead of a star, right? When i is 1 and j is 1, i is 1, j is 2, i is 2, j is 1, and i is 2 and j is 2. The standard way of like combining those ideas are uh, is that like we want to make sure that we print a space when i is between 1 and 2, and at the same time j is between 1 and 2. If this is true about i and j, we should print a space rather than a star. Yes? We just need to translate that to code. You cannot uh, put... You can do this in Python. You cannot do this in C++. You can't say if 1 is less than or equal to i is less than or equal to 2. That does not work. You have to split it up. You have to translate it into if 1 is less than or equal to i and i is less than or equal to 2. Okay? That's the way you do it. So let's make this if statement. So if i is, well, let's just do it backwards. i is greater than or equal to 1, and i is less than or equal to 2, and j is greater than or equal to 1, and j is greater than or equal to 2. Let me put those on the same line by itself. j is less than or equal to 2. Then space. That describes exactly the values that should have a space printed for i and j. Else, star. Does that idea make sense to us? You just section off which, which values you want to have a space printed versus a star printed. And this will get the range that we care about. You could also care about the outer edge. If you would like to have the if part print a star rather than a space, you have to like figure out what it means for this to be true, this to be true, you to be here or here. Those are more locations, so it seems harder to me. I'd rather just deal with the spaces. There's only four of those. So let's try that way. So instead of always printing a star, only sometimes. If i is greater than equal to 1, and j is, le i is less than or equal to 2, and j is greater than or equal to 1, and j is less than or equal to 2, then print space, else print star. Whee. And so this is when you're in the middle. We figured out what ranges were in the middle. There it is. Lovely. Any questions about that? There's a bunch of different ways you could do that same condition. You can just check, hey, is i equal to 1 and j equal to 1? Or i equal 1 and j equal to 2? Or i equal 2, j equals 1? Or i equal 2, j equals 2? That will also 
figure out when it's in there. It's another way to do it. But I think that's the that's the way I would do it. Any questions about that? All right, I've got more examples. So now I'd like to draw, instead of a box, let's draw a triangle. That'll be fun. Let's draw a left-leaning right triangle using nested loops. So this is like a 4x4, four four, one of those. Here's the idea. Again, you can kind of start with your box drawing stuff. Like, I can be 0 on this first line. I can be 1 on this line. We can try and use that to our advantage. Gosh. I just want to draw another I, please. I equals 1 on this line. I equals 2 on this line. I equals 3 on this line. And now the idea is, depending on what line you're on, you're, you draw a different number of stars, right? So on this line, I need to draw a certain number of stars. Stars. The answer is one, of course. On this line, I need to draw a certain number of stars. Can anybody find me something that I could put into this blank that's the same both times and have it draw the correct number of stars? Like on this line, it draws zero. On this line, it draws one. What could I put in the blank to have it draw the correct number of stars where that thing doesn't change? Like, it's you'd tell me to draw 42, I'd have to put it in both places. 42, 42. Something like that, yeah. Something involving I, yeah? What would it be? If I is zero and I want to draw one star, how can I make one from zero? I is 0 plus 1 will make 1, right? When I is 1 and I want 2, what do I put? I plus 1. It can always be the same, and so that could be the body of the loop. You see that? Always do the same thing. That screams loop. And it works for every line. Depending on I... Use that in your inner loop. Use your current value of i to manipulate what you do, to change how you do it. Okay? Any questions about that idea? We're now just not like, we're, we're actually looking at i and j now. Like here for this box, we just used i and j to loop four times. We didn't use i or j in any of the body. We started using it here to draw the hollow box, and now we're going to use it in a very different way. We can mostly start with what we had, though. Whee. So this, this inner part, is not print four stars in any line. It's print i plus one stars and a new line. Does that make sense why that will print a triangle? Because when i is zero, it'll print one star. When i is one, it'll print two stars. When i is... 2, it'll print 3 stars. It'll follow this pattern one more every time. Yes? So I just need to make this, I need to translate this into code. Print i plus 1 stars in a new line. Well, I know how to do something multiple times. For int j equals 0, j is less than i plus 1. Just like this iterates 4 times, this is going to iterate i plus 1 times. See the pattern? j plus plus. Print a single star. And then a new line. And there it goes. And this can be as long as you want it to. You can make i50 and it will still do the right thing. Because this is the correct formula. i plus 1 each line. So we are using now, this is weird, we're using our outer loops iteration variable to control how many times the inner loop executes. That's pretty cool. So that is a new interesting thing. Okay, any questions about this code? Why it does what it does? Why it needed to be like this? Because we're slowly absorbing this information, I hope. And then here was the strategy. Does the strategy still make sense? Why it translated into what we, what we had it as? 
because if we're good, I have one more uh, example for us. Okay, so all of these drawing examples were based on the idea from this first slide that I showed you. We noticed that loops multiply work, right? We've been multiplying work to draw a bunch of a bunch of stars, or a bunch of a bunch of stars to make a box, or a bunch of stars to make a triangle. The other thing that a loop is very good at is notice this output. Do you see that every possible combination of 0 through 4 for both i and j appears in the output? Every possible combination is there. 0, 0, 1, 0, whatever you want. Every possible combination of two digits where those digits are between 0 and 4 appears in this output. Because that's the last major thing that a nested loop is good at. Do we notice that? You see it now? Last key idea, nested loops try all the combinations of values. Okay? Computers are pretty fast these days, so you can do silly things with them, like try every possible combination, even though that's not the most efficient way to do things. A computer can do it pretty quickly anyway. So that leads us into what's called a brute force algorithm. Just, you throw your computer at a problem, uh, and it just, it solves it in a very naive way, but it's just so fast, it, it solves it. So a brute force algorithm is one that just tries every single possibility that could be there to see if that's the answer, okay? So computer is pretty fast, it can run a few billion instructions a second, so for small enough problems, this works well. So here's my silly problem for us. So let's say we are a, a farmer, or we are, like, we're doing this from a farmer's perspective. So the farmer is trying to buy horses, pigs, and rabbits. We know that a farmer did this. So here was the price for the day. Horses cost $10 if you want to buy one. Pigs cost $3. And rabbits are apparently on sale for 50 cents. We know that a farmer bought 100 animals. And the farmer spent $100 on those animals total. So the problem is, let's figure out how many of each animal did this farmer buy? How many? Okay, let's see. This is a problem to solve. So we need to try every possible combination of buying horses, pigs, and rabbits, right? Because the farmer bought 100 of them for $100. So let's just range through every possibility. Why not? It's possible that the farmer bought 100 horses, zero pigs, and zero rabbits, same for zero horses, 100 pigs, zero rabbits. As long as it adds to 100, we're good. So let's just try every possibility, even though we know that like you can't buy 100 horses for $100. Let's just try every possibility. We'll have three iteration variables. We'll have a triply nested loop, where like the number of horses is allowed to range between 0 and 100 inclusive, because that's a possibility. Just bought 100 horses and zero of everything else. The number of pigs that the farmer bought, we can simulate that to be between 0 and 100 again. Like you could buy 100 pigs and none of anything else. And finally, num rabbits should also range between 0 and 100. If we range over every possible combination of these three numbers, we will find the answer. Yes? Or the answers. There's no other possibility. Some of these combinations make no sense, like 100 horses, 100 pigs, 100 rabbits. That's outside of the scope of the definition of the problem. But we're not skipping anything, right? Some of them will be exactly 100 animals, and some of them, if there is a solution to this, for those 100 animals, will add up to $100. So let's try every combination of horses, pigs, and rabbits, see if we can solve the problem. So we need a triply nested for loop, triply nested loop, could be a while loop, uh, to try all the combinations of the three numbers. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3 for rabbits. And then we'll increment 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2. Just keep on trying every single possibility, just like this was trying every single possibility between 0 and 4 for i and j. Are we ready? Does this make any sense at all? Are there any questions about it? Oh, the brute force algorithm. Let me try every possibility. Let's do it. 
All right, so you could have zero horses to 100 horses, or int num horses equals zero, num horses less than or equal to 100, num horses plus plus. So that will range between zero and 100 horses. I'd like to do the same for pigs and rabbits. Whee! So num... Pigs can range between 0 and 100, and then num rabbits. Oops. Can range between 0 and 100 as well. And these are all triply nested loops. And so if I put something in here, when I'm here, let me actually go to my notes and make sure I'm telling you exactly what I want to tell you when I'm lecture seven. Oh, whatever. All right, when I am here, I have chosen some amount. Of horses, pigs, and rabbits. This loop body will try every possibility. It will range over every possibility. Every possibility will get a chance. We'll execute the loop body with zero, like 50 horses, 25 pigs, and 25 rabbits. That is a possibility. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Does that make sense? We're going to range over every possible combination of those three numbers between 0 and 100. And some of them are going to be exactly 100 animals, right? So let's figure out how many animals we bought when we're here. So we have some, some amount, some amount of horses, pigs, and rabbits. And num animals equals num horses. How many horses? Oh, shoot. Didn't mean to press that. Plus num pigs plus num rabbits. So that's the number of horses bought total for this particular combination. If it's 100, oops. We're in the clear. We also, we also should figure out how much all these animals cost. So double price equals, well, it's num horses times 10 plus num pigs times 3, right? They were $3 plus num rabbits uh, times 50 cents, 0 0.5. Okay? And that will be the price. So we found a solution to our problem if the animals was 100 and the price was 100, okay? And this is one of those do as I say, not as I do moments because I'm actually going to check a double for equality. I can get exact equality here. Uh, do, not, do not try this at home unless you have a PhD in computer science. All right, num animals, if that's equal to 100, and price is equal to 100, just due to a quirk of the way doubles work, I can check for equality here. It will work out. Do not assume that ever, though. Uh, if I am here, if I'm in the body, I've tried all these possibilities, and this hit, this is true, I found a solution. Yes? Yay. Let's print it out. So it took this many... Horses, pigs, and rabbits. So here's a solution. This many horses. And let's see, then we need a comma and a space. Num pigs. Pigs. Comma space. And then num rabbits. Rabbits. New line. So I'm just printing out the possibilities. All those numbers that we generated here, because apparently there's a hundred of them and the price is a hundred. And that's a solution. Let me try and get this all on the same line for us. Visible. Okay, can I put this entire loop on the page for you? Let's see. Not very easily. Let me kind of zoom out just a little bit. There. So there's the outer loop. Trying all the horses, all the pigs, all the rabbits. Here's how many there were. Here was their price. If this random amount 
was 100 animals total and the price was $100 total. That was a solution to our problem and we should print it out. Oops, what did I do wrong? No, forgot a P. So it appears that, you see how fast it was to try what? It executed this body a hundred times, a hundred times, a hundred times. That was, that's a lot, right? It looks like these are the two solutions. Zero horses, 20 pigs, and 80 rabbits. We can check all those solutions. First of all, that body ran in the blink of an eye. It ran that inner loop's body a hundred times, a hundred times, a hundred times. That was, that was only a million times. That's super fast for a computer can do that pretty quickly. And then here are the solutions. We can check those solutions. So 20 pigs and 80 rabbits. So 20 times 3 plus 80 times 0.5. Yeah, that's $100. And then 5 horses, 1 pig, and 94 rabbits. 5 times 10 plus 1 times 3 plus, what was it, 94 rabbits? Okay. 94 times 0.5. And that was the other solution. Adds up to $100 total. That's pretty neat. All right. It's just some combination of them. We're trying all the combinations. And so there are two solutions to this problem, and we didn't know where they were. We just let the computer try every single one of them, see if it was, uh, if it was true. Okay? Any questions about this problem? That's the other thing that nested loops are good for, just trying a bunch of possibilities. Technically, if you think about this long enough, you notice that you don't need a num rabbits variable inside of a loop. You don't need the third loop. Because if you've taken statistics to this problem, for this problem, there are only two degrees of freedom. Once you've made a choice for how many numbers of horses and pigs you get, the number of rabbits is set if you want 100 of them, right? Total. Just subtract. Uh, you can think about that after class, though. Ask me about it if you're interested. But yeah, the easiest way is a triply nested loop. We did it. We get to move on to the last example of the day. All right. So, last example, I would like to get you in the spirit of executing code in your mind, like I did for the conditionals slide. So let's take this program and translate it to a diagram. Translate it to a flowchart diagram so that we can spell out exactly how it's running. We've got code before and code after, and in between we have a nested loop, a while on the outside and a four on the inside. Let's draw how this is going to run. So we come in at the before, And then we run our for and while loops exactly how I taught you how they run. So first, when we run a while loop, we always check the condition before we run the body. We only run the body if that condition is true. Right? So A is the very first thing that happens for this doubly nested loop. If A is false, we skip the whole loop, right? We go straight to after, way down here. If A happens to be false, we are done with the loop, right? That's what it means to not do a while loop. But if A is true, then we execute the body of the while loop, right? Which involves running another loop. We execute the whole thing. So off we go. We need to execute now this for loop entirely. How do you execute a for loop? Well, it's got an initialization, a condition, an increment, and a body. The very first thing that happens with the for loop is the initialization. That first line, that B, gets run first. So let's run it. The very first thing that happens for that inner loop is B. Okay? And then we start. We start the for loop. The for loop repeatedly checks the condition as if it's true, it runs the body and then the increment and comes back to the condition. That all over and over and over and over again. Okay? So if B, or sorry, after doing B, we check the condition. That's the start of the for loop. If the condition is true, we execute the body and the increment, right? This is looking weird probably because it's using variables rather than actual code, but this is what's happening, right? So if the condition is true, true, we do E, that's the body, then the increment, and then we go back to the condition C again, okay? We just repeat that process, that's the for loop after the initialization.
Is that coming back to us? We're just working on that for loop right now. And then eventually the for loop's going to be done. What does it mean for the loop to be done? That means the condition is false. Okay? Once the condition is false, we are, well, we continue with more lines down here if there were any, but there aren't any. So we're done with one iteration of the while loop. How do we continue the while loop? Once we're done with the while loop's body, we have to check the condition again. So that means if this is ever false, this condition of the for loop, we're done with the body of the while loop. We need to go back to check the condition A again. Boop. Like that. And I believe that is the entire program translated into a diagram, how it's going to move around. Okay? So you can see the outer loop and the inner loop now. So as long as the outer loop condition is true, you're going to go to the inner loop, run the body as many times as you need to, once it becomes false, we go back to the outer loop. As long as it's true, we're going to go back to the inner loop. Just some figure eights going on here with some multiple lines down in that for loop. And eventually, we'll come back here to the start, and it will be false. And then we're finally done with everything. So I don't expect you to be able to translate this yet, but hopefully hearing me talk through it all is making a little bit of sense to you. That's what I'm, what I'm after right now. Okay. Any questions about this? All right, uh, here's my last example. It's just a meme. Uh, this is kind of showing you how a nested loop kind of works. It tries every possibility. Here are the different values of i. Here are the different values of j. And once you put them together, you're going to get nine possibilities total, right? That's the idea. OK, so that is where I want to leave us. We are in week four right now. I just want to keep you up to speed. Next lecture, I'm going to talk about your midterm. Your midterm is going to be during week six. I'll release a lot of information about it then, not today, next time. Uh, and I think that is everything that I wanted to say today. No new lab this week either, because you got your lab two during week five. Do week five, I'll release the new lab next week then. But next class, I'll talk about your midterm. So I think that's everything that I wanted to say for the lecture.